Hello, my name is Lawrence Sumet, and these are some lessons learned teaching visual effects and animation. Now, this presentation was originally produced and developed for the CGA Belgrade conference in 2019. I've been to many CGI conferences in my life and I really enjoyed this one. It was uh, thorough uh, enough to have really great content and fantastic people, but it was also nice and focused and uh, you, you had the opportunity to really get to meet everybody and really connect with the group. Um, so highly recommended CGA Belgrade. Go check it out at cgabelgrade.com. All right, so this is what I look like. Hey, how's it going? Um, so as I mentioned, my name is Lawrence Smet. How's it going? If you're not from Canada, is a very common way to greet someone. Uh, it's also a great way to engage a classroom and get them to direct their attention to you. A little pro tip before we get into it. Um, but let me introduce myself first. So, hey, there's me. There he is. So uh, I'm from Toronto, uh, Ontario in Canada, and uh, as I said, my name is Lawrence Sumet. I'm a part-time professor of visual effects at Centennial College here in Toronto, and uh, I'm CG supervisor at Folks VFX, which is a VFX studio servicing film and TV uh, headquartered in Montreal and based in Toronto and Bogota, Colombia. Um, I've been teaching for over 12 years now. Uh, I've also developed courses for colleges and helped governments define skill sets. Um, previously to working at Folks, I worked for nine years at Autodesk on the uh, Maya development team, and 10 years before that, uh, I worked in production in visual effects and animation in Toronto in various capacities. So. Uh, I'll talk a bit first about Centennial College. So let me get my picture out of the way. There we go. So Centennial College um, is a, a community college in, in Ontario. Um, it has campuses uh, in several locations, but the most important for me anyways is the campus that we have downtown, which is close to the local studios um, and industries that it serves. Um, it focuses on creative and storytelling arts. Uh, it's dedicated to international diversity, uh, and it, it tends to be a common entry point for international students coming into Canada. Um, it, uh, the focus is to embrace the skill sets that they bring into the country, and most importantly, it has decades of practice in employing industry professionals as teachers, which I'm going to talk quite a bit about. Um, so there are two programs at Centennial that I teach in. One is the digital animation program, and the other is the digital effects program, uh, which I, I developed. So, and I'll show you a bit of the kind of work that gets done in that program. Folks VFX is a very artist-driven visual effects studio doing high-end uh, television and streaming content. It's worked on shows like Shadowhunters, Umbrella Academy, movies as well. So a lot of really cool work, and it's a really great studio because it, it's really about embracing great artists and uh, creating a good teaching environment where people learn and always improve. So it's a place I really like working, and you can check out some of the work we do here. So some really cool stuff, and uh, here you can see our awesome team at uh, Folks VFX, and uh, I'm going to come back to some of these people soon. These are, this is the Toronto crew, the time we took the picture. 
they're very dear to me so all right let me get my head back in here hey so uh, normally when I do this presentation I take attendance because as a teacher you really need to know uh, who your audience is and, and tailor what you're saying to them now I can't do that right here um, but if you are a CGI industry professional uh, a teacher uh, who, who teaches CGI work animation or VFX or your studio leadership uh, you're in the right place and I hope you get something out of this presentation so uh, let me keep going a quick agenda here today I want to talk about uh, uh, you know why teaching is important my goal here is to inspire industry industry professionals to see the benefit of teaching uh, and give them some tools to get started um, I want to share learnings gained from a unique perspective as both a teacher and an industry professional and someone who worked in software vending and uh, um, to help people deliver useful teaching skills uh, and that will help industry pros both become good teachers and anyone uh, be a better teacher in everyday life. Um, and, and ultimately the goal here is to deliver techniques and tips uh, that I found generate the best students, the people, the artists who you want to to hire. So I'm going to talk a bit, not just about um, developing the course, not just about teaching, but also in getting those students from the classroom to the workplace. So I hope that sounds good. Okay, so this all starts with talent. In my previous position, I worked on the Maya team at Autodesk, uh, helping to make software to produce animation games and VFX. And for nine years, my job was basically to travel around the world talking to studios about Maya. But whenever I went, I always tried to ask what really kept them up at night. Um, it wasn't software, and it wasn't money, and it wasn't clients. Uh, routinely, it was hiring enough talent. And this is only a problem that's only getting worse. You, uh, if you hear, I'll, I'll move them away. There we go. You can see the results. There's massive growth in content, and that's fueling a need for more and more talent. Um, our industry is growing wildly, and it's never been a better time to be an artist in media entertainment. Currently, I'm recording this during the COVID-19 pandemic, where things are not so great, but uh, I'm confident things will pick up again, and there'll be even more of a need. Um, so in 2019, there's an estimated $108 billion in U.S. dollars uh, spending uh, spent on content. And uh, the projection for 2020 is that the gaming industry alone will spend $160 billion. And now, from an industry's perspective, that puts media entertainment in one of the top grossing industries. It's huge. Um, and that needs that talent to produce all that content. And what's really cool about this big streaming boom is this new business model that Netflix and other streamers are using uh, really ties content success to revenue. More good shows, more subscribers, more subscribers sticking around, and it also encourages local content. Uh, the more providers can cater to individual markets, the more subscribers they get. Um, so it just means more for everybody. And to do this, we need talent. Um, that talent right now, unfortunately, is all coming from other uh, studios, right? It's a great time to be an artist. You can really find the job you like, but that's not tenable in the long term. We need to be hiring more and more from schools and producing students that can fill this need. Um, and this is tricky. So there are very high expectations for a hireable graduate in the field of visual effects and animation. So what you see here uh, is a fantastic effort from a group called the Core Skill Sets in UK. This is now called Screen Skills UK, and it was a uh, set of uh, learning outcomes, set of skills uh, determined to be required for a VFX student to graduate by a team of 60 experts in the field. So this is really cool. They, they outlined everything you need to know or be able to do as a student to be an effective graduate in the visual effects industry. Um, and you can see there's a lot here. <laughs> this, is, this is a ton of work. Some people take 10 years to amass this kind of knowledge. And, and to be effective in the current high demand state of industry and its growth, um, it gets very tricky, uh, especially since the industry is changing so quickly. What a student needs to know is, a, is becoming a moving target, uh, as is my face. 
The lines between traditional industries are blending, game engines are becoming everyday in visual effects, and education often isn't catching up to these trends. Um, that document we just saw, in all its glory and beauty, uh, it's a great achievement, but at the same time it's slowly becoming out of date as the months go by. And it's a lot of work to keep that up to date. So um, not only is it tough for students to join the industry, it's also tough for teachers to keep up with these changes. It's a challenge. Being a teacher, it, it's just a lot of work involved. And um, and making that investment in, in your content that you need to teach and constantly keeping updated, it's a ton of work. Um, the challenges of, of hiring talent, obviously being an industry professional, gets you closer to these industry changes and gets you closer to what you need to do. That doesn't mean a full-time teacher isn't going to do a good, great job, um, but I think there's a great opportunity for industry pros to contribute to the education system. But at the same time, going out and talking to a lot of studios, uh, what I hear when I talk to them about education, I hear these challenges come up routinely. So uh, uh, the industry moves so fast and full-time teachers tend to struggle to keep up and often fall on old established curricula uh, defined at an earlier time. Uh, the problem is when you're not doing this work daily and updating your skills daily because you have to, it's harder to keep up. And at the same time, uh, a lot of education systems are built on some very concrete rules and concrete learning outcomes um, that require that rigidity and make it hard to flex and change. And so we'll talk about how we can make that work. Um, as a result, students are graduating with out-of-date skills. Uh, and really, when we think about what a student should be learning, they should be learning skills for the next two years, um, not two years ago, uh, because things are changing so fast. Uh, studios get frustrated with that lack of critical skills and knowledge, and they end up training themselves. I talked to a lot of studios who ended up building their own schools. Students come out of colleges, uh, and then they go into school again. Um, and ultimately, I think that that's not the greatest thing, right? And at the same time, even though industry pros know the stuff that the students need to know, they're not trained professors, they don't have experience teaching, and they don't always make great teachers. They may know the stuff, but that doesn't mean you can get a student to do it. Um, and at the end of us all, students often come out of school, they might know the tick boxes for uh, what critical skills they need to do the job, but they may be lacking in soft skills, and I'm going to talk about that quite a bit. Now, it's not easy for students either. Right? Um, as a student, to really be good at something, you have to go through all these steps. You have to learn the basics, you have to learn the tools to do the job, learn the techniques to use the tools, then become proficient in that. You have to develop your vision uh, uh, to be able to say, okay, that's actually going to look good. What's, how am I going to do something that looks good? Um, then you start to build on that with the soft skills to bring that to the table and make it work with the team, and eventually you master it. And that takes a long time. Um, most programs don't allow enough time to get to this level, and yet it's expected of a student to be really good at this stuff. Um, so you can see filling the gaps in our workforce is going to be a significant challenge. And so he here's the way I look at the challenge. You can see my white screen has just illuminated me. Uh, how do we get hireable graduates into the workforce in a sustainable way? Um, it's not fair to say schools just need to do a better job. They're doing a great job already. I think this is a team effort between industry and education, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that. All right, so here's the idea. Enable industry pros to be vi viable educators. Um, what I'm proposing here is that teachers that teach graduates in our industry are themselves working industry professionals. Of course, there are academic si considerations, but really I'm talking about a, situ a vocational situation, students looking to join the workforce as artists. Um, in many ways, this is already best practice in many places. Um, it was when I visited Serbia and CGA Belgrade, I met a studio called Crowder um, that already did this. And so it, it's it's not a mystery, this, but um, I want to talk about some of the things uh, that we've done at Centennial College to, to make this more viable. And I think what Centennial did that I really love is that they get the pros into the process from the very beginning, even before a course is developed. Um, 
And you really have to start with making sure that the industry pros know the value of teaching, right? And and this is, to me, this is the key part. And this is what, I, I've been a teacher and an industry pro for a long time, and this is what I love about it. When you are training your workforce, they can be plug and play. You can train someone in the skills that you need for your studio, hire them, and they're off and running, right? Um, you gotta make sure you're giving them a, a solid set of skills, but there's always room for focus. And that focus could be towards your workforce that you need. Um, at the same time, you will be a better pro. You think you know what you're doing, but it's only until you try and teach something that you realize there may be holes in your knowledge because you never had to deal with that problem. Someone else might have, or it just never came up. Um, but having to teach something really makes sure you need, you know something solidly from end to end. Um, and that's ultimately uh, made me a better artist and I've seen it made, make many others a better artist. And also, succession is important. Um, I hate to say it, one day you might get hit by a bus. Uh, you want to make sure the, the studio and the ship can keep going, right? So it, it's really about, as an artist, as someone who's seen success and has a lot of experience, it's, it's on us to train the next generation and make them even better than we were. And that, to me, is something I'm very passionate about. And you're not just training the next artist. Those artists are going to come in and they're going to be leaders. So you got to think about the soft skills that are needed to create the next set of great leaders. Teaching is a powerful way to build these skills. And it's a powerful way to grow the next generation of, of leaders. The best part is that you will be a better leader by being a teacher. Um, it teaches you a lot about human behavior, and that's something that, that has gone into being a, a supervisor, and that's helped me in a big way. And lastly, it's not as hard as you think. What's great is, as a, as a teacher, there's an upfront investment in building curriculum material um, and all your course materials, but once you do that, you really only have to update it uh, as needed. And so uh, you get good at it, it becomes a lot more fun the more you do it. And I think the opportunity here the real value in being an industry professional that's also a teacher is in creating a, a feedback loop. And it can be a very powerful thing to watch. You teach someone and mentor them, inspire them. Um, they get into the industry through your teaching. They learn, they teach others, they become leaders, and that cycle continues. I was inspired to go into CG by an industry professional and who, who taught me, and uh, he encouraged me to teach. And since then, I've hired my own students, and some of them I've watched grow up to be teachers and start that cycle again. And it's really cool to see this. I'll give you a great example. So uh, Matt Rich. Um, amazing uh, rigger, uh, rigging TD at uh, Tangent Studio in Toronto. He's someone who's always blew me away. When when I was teaching um, my rendering to him, he came up to me and said, "Lawrence, I'm not really not happy with the way rendering is set up in Maya. What do other studios do with do about it?" And I said, "Well, a lot of them will build their own custom scripts to to deal with this problem." Um, and he said, "Okay, cool. That's what I'm going to do." And he did. And uh, and from then on, you know, I've watched him become incredibly successful and start to teach on his own way. And he's he's really Really, uh, taken to teaching, embraced it, and uh, it's made him a better uh, TD, and also produced some amazing students coming out of his class. Definitely a great example of uh, the value of being a teacher as an industry professional. So, none of this starts without the course itself. And so if you're in a position to create a new course or update uh, a current course, this is a good place to start getting things right. You know, if, if you're an industry professional and you're saying, hey, you've convinced me this sounds awesome, let's do it. Getting active uh, with your local college is a great place to start. And this is where industry input is so important in developing a course. So. Courses start with a successful criteria, and to get to that criteria, it's best to engage the industry right out of the gate. Um, whether you're a teacher or not, you should have a voice. They need you at the table. Centennial College, for example, has something called Program Advisory Councils that meet every year, 
and they provide input to the development of uh, new courses and the modification of existing courses. Um, if many colleges and schools have these kinds of advisory councils, and if you're an industry member and you want to be active with education, this should be the first place you should go. The key outcome from, from these conversations is often a learning outcome. And if you know anything about education, learning outcomes are really uh, the most important thing to get right. A curriculum isn't just a bunch of topics and assignments that test them. A curriculum is a defined set of learning outcomes. What does a graduate need to be able to do to graduate from this course? For example, here's a great one. Collaborate in an interdisciplinary team to complete a professional quality short film. To me, that sounds like a great uh, learning outcome you'd like to have in a student. I think so. But it's important to get these right. So here's an example of a common learning outcome, something everybody wants a student, someone who can meet deadlines. But what does that really mean? Crafting good learning outcomes means that you design outcomes that are uh, demonstrable, uh, measurable, and clear. So here's a, here's a good example. Prioritize the requirements and milestones of a VFX piece through pre-production techniques. So this is a lot more clear about what needs to be done. The outcome, ultimately, for the artist is someone who can meet deadlines. But now we can measure this. Did they prioritize? Um, did they set milestones? Did they meet them? Um, did they use pre-production techniques? But what, what's also great about this outcome is that it's flexible. There are different ways to do this. Everybody has a different way to do it. Um, teachers can work within this constraint in a flexible way, but still meet the, the desired qualities in a student when they graduate. I'll give you another example. Light an object. Again, good thing to know how to do. But even better, analyze the properties of light and reference imagery to produce a matching photorealistic rendering. Can that person look at a reference image, match it, and produce the same look? Because that way, it's not a fluke. It's for real, right? So outcomes are critically important, and there's a ton of discussion that goes into them, and this is where the industry input is so critical. And outcomes aren't just in the course assignments. They're a chain. They end at the assignment level, and each assignment has a set of outcomes that are measured. Do you get an A, a B, a C, D? Um, and those assignment outcomes are used to test course outcomes. Um, so a course will have a set of outcomes that need to be met to graduate from that course. That course outcomes will be driven by school outcomes. So what is the school value in a student? What is unique about that school that they want to embrace in a student and produce in a student? And those outcomes drive the course outcomes, which drive the assignment outcomes. Then there's a ministry. Usually an education ministry will set goals for uh, a particular region or, or an education system uh, that need to be met by the schools through their courses and their assignments. And then lastly, there's at the, at the beginning of the chain is the uh, outcome set by the government. So uh, governments will set skill set definitions that um, not just uh, embrace defining uh, what a role or a job is to help def uh, instruct other areas. It also lets the government set, this, this is the kind of people we want to produce. These are gaps in our brain trust for our country uh, or region. What do we need to build up? And so those outcomes will trickle down all the way down to the student doing the assignment to produce a, a person that takes a great part in a success society, right? Now, it's not just about the learning outcomes. It's very important that you have the right support. A good coordinator, program coordinator is key. They, uh, they need to know the industry um, and they need to know the school as well. Uh, on the left here is Dalbert Janovich and on the right is John Lee. These are coordinators at Centennial College, the Animation and Digital Visual Effects Program. They do an amazing job. They both come from the industry um, and they both have had a lot of experience dealing with the school. So they can bridge those two gaps and help work with the teachers to create the course and make sure the school is meeting their outcomes. Really critical. It's also very important to have dedicated IT professionals. Um, one of the things that can commonly go wrong in visual effects and animation in a school is that uh, the IT requirements are more more in some cases than many other programs, so they tend to need a unique person. Um, those coordinators 
coming from the industry know that uh, people are busy and they need to be flexible. So Centennial College, uh, most of the classes are evening classes from 6 to 9 p.m. Um, that allows professionals to finish work and then come and teach. And schedules are flexible. Sometimes you can't, as a teacher, as an industry professional being a teacher, you can't always make your classes. Um, so it's really important that you, as a, when you're designing a program, you allow it to be flexible enough that a uh, teacher can move a class around. You know, it's tougher for the students, but they're getting a working industry pro, so it tends to work out. Okay. So hopefully this is sounding pretty cool uh, if you're an industry professional and you're you're thinking about teaching now, but how do we make this work? Step one is pedagogy. Uh, this is the method and practice of teaching, uh, especially an, as an academic subject or theoretical concept. But let's start with the pitfalls. So where where does this all go wrong? When you when you start to bring in industry professionals, what happens? It doesn't always work out. So what I've seen over uh, over a decade of teaching, tends industry prof professionals tend to be too busy and they get into scheduling conflicts. They might come in with a list of techniques that they think the students need based on the learning outcomes just fine for the course. They hand them a list and say, go. Lecturing can often go over students' heads. I remember seeing some beautiful lectures that I was just blown away by. Students just glossed over and were in space. They, they weren't paying attention because it went too long or it went over heads or they weren't engaged enough to follow along. Um, a lot of times uh, industry pros forget that they have a, a quite a bit of experience in this area and that people don't know, students don't know what they know and haven't gone through what they have. So you really have to step things back and keep things as basic as possible, especially in the beginning. And a great example of this is jargon. Sometimes it's very hard to explain something without using jargon. Um, there's ways around this, but um, it can be a challenge, especially if you're dealing with people who, who's, uh, for example, your native language isn't their uh, native language. Soft skills can be ignored as well, and this can be a problem. You might be a creative student who can hit all the buttons, but that doesn't make them a hireable person. So how do we avoid all these? Step one is onboarding. So if you're if you're building a course and you're hiring industry pros as teachers, you really have to build a good onboarding program. Um, so teach them basic pedagogy. This is how the, the science of teaching. This is how you teach something. Uh, basic social psychology, how to read people, how to understand human behavior enough so that you can get through the various barriers and make sure someone knows something. And I'll talk a lot about this as we get into details. Um, the school parameters, so here's how to work in the school, what the grades mean, here are the dates you have to hit. Um, you know, these things are important. How to accommodate special needs. A lot of schools accommodate for special needs students um, and that can get very tricky especially when teaching something technical like uh, visual effects or animation. Um, maybe this lecture is a good tool to include in your onboarding program. Uh, let me know if it is and uh, you know ultimately the challenge we have is uh, our job as teachers is to take someone through this learning curve. I didn't make this image. Uh, the original comic is from XKCD, uh, awesome comic, and someone in the uh, VFX Reddit modified it to illustrate the challenge that happens when trying to learn uh, the software we use in visual effects and animation. Um, so you can see the toughness of getting around this learning curve. It can be a huge challenge. And a big part of the problem is getting through to someone. Um, so here you see the cone of learning defined by Edgar Dale in 1957. And ultimately what you're seeing here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, probably you can, um, is that the more engaged someone is, the more they retain. So doing the real thing, you retain 90%. Watching a demonstration, 50%. So we see a, a standard lecture clocks in at 50% retention, which isn't enough. Right? If someone is giving a talk themselves, they'll remember 70% of what they say. Right? So the, the gist of this is that the more engaged you are as a student, the more you will learn. So where this has been... It, now, th there's aspects of this that you know, since 1957 have, have changed. Um, you know, where, where it's been proven incorrect is that when a student really wants to learn something, 
they will recall much more than 10% of what they read, for example. If someone really loves something and they really want to learn it, they're going to remember a lot more. And that's kind of the critical factor to move all our efforts higher on this on this chart. So to me, ultimately, being a great teacher means getting people to love what you are teaching. And we're going to cover a lot of tips here on how to do that. The first one I'll give you is the power of repetition. I can't understate this enough. If you repeat something three times, people will remember it much more than if you repeat it once. If you repeat something three times, people will remember it more. Repeat things three times. It works like magic. There's no way to avoid lecturing and studying and, and those things that were on the bottom of that chart. But what I found is working in class one-on-one -on -one is far more effective than students working and learning on their own time. And so what you can do is make your class time more about working time with the teacher together and take those learning opportunities. You will learn much faster if you can catch, if, if you're caught red-handed, if you have a problem and the minute you have that problem, someone comes, your teacher, and says, hey, here's how to fix this. It's ingrained. It's in there. But if you have a problem and then three days later you send an email and then three more days pass and you get a response or you find it on the internet, it's not going to stick. Right. So learning through doing is better than learning by watching or studying. Uh, it's really engaging a student that is the real opportunity to cement something. Here you can see uh, in one study uh, I found showing that uh, you know the failure rates are much lower are much lower um, when you have an active classroom as opposed to a lecture classroom. Right. So ultimately, it's use it or lose it. And you can take this to the next level. It's not just about doing something that engage it. Breaking something, altering it. And this is something actually uh, uh, I learned from uh, Matt, Matt Rich, who I showed you before, really cements it. If you break something and then figure out how to fix it again, you will know it inherently. Some of the science on this is it, it's definitely still not exact. We're still learning a lot about how the human brain learns something. And there are a lot of factors involved. One of the interesting things uh, that they recently figured out is that delaying feedback, um, not giving feedback immediately, can actually improve internalization of the information. But there's a very uh, distinct constraint to that, but it's only when the student's interest is peaked. And that thing, that delay, was actually the, the anticipation. The more, if the student's really engaged and interested in something, if you make them wait a little bit, to get the answer, they'll actually internalize it more. But they have to be interested in it first for that to work. The more they want the answer, the more they're suffering to get to the answer, the more they'll retain something and, and not much more than just hearing a fact in a lecture, right? To engage someone to, it's a personal thing. Um, you really have to know somebody and you have to uh, break the ice. And this can be hard, especially in more international scenarios when you have people coming from different cultures. Um, it's not that you need to be friends, but if you're able to talk with each other, you'll be able to do a much better job as a teacher. Uh, in big classes, that can be a big problem. You have to learn your students' names. You have to know how they're referred to. So at, at Centennial, we, we do this exercise where the students all take a picture holding their name and their preferred name. And uh, this is handed to new teachers when they come in before the class so they can get familiar with the students before they even meet them. And this has been a huge help because immediately you can go, oh, that's so-and-so. I want to connect with them. I know who they are. Um, what I like to do, uh, you can look up a, a Pecha Kucha, for example, um, but ultimately what you want to do is get people to tell a small story about themselves. You'll remember that a bit more than a name. And once you're on speaking terms, you'll have a much easier time engaging with the classroom. Um, they need to know each other as well. It's really important. We're going to get into how important it is for the classroom to teach each other for, and to act like a team. So the more everybody knows about each other right off the bat, the more you can break the ice, the better your classroom is going to flow. Um, the other thing that this does is it gives you some window into who's on the table. In a college setting, you can have people coming from all kinds of worlds. They could be graduating out of high school. They could be adults changing their career midlife. People have a lot of background that they bring to the table that you may not know about. And I'll give you some examples of this in the future. It's pretty cool. Okay. 
I want to share an approach that I've developed over time uh, through the input of uh, many other teachers, um, and it's really worked for me, and it really embraces that um, repeating something three times to cement it. So if you're going to give a class, the night before the class, make sure the students have some kind of pre-recorded basics video that you've produced or an online tutorial that speaks to the basic concept that you're trying to get someone to wrap their head around. Allow that to sink in overnight. And then the next day in class, give a quick workflow demonstration. So try and keep the lecture minimum. Um, show them how to do that technique and walk them through the concepts and the basics uh, and explain the assignment that they need to do to test that, uh, that those concepts and the techniques that are required to meet that learning outcome. The best way to do this is actually to have that assignment happen in class. And you remember me saying that that being able to to catch someone red-handed, to to uh, inform them on the spot, it really helps. So if you give them the assignment, if you keep the lecture small, give them the assignment in class and allow them to work on it in class. And if you have a small enough class, walk amongst them and help each one individually, you'll find they'll, they'll learn so much quicker and even better, they'll get their assignments done faster and have more time uh, to work on other things and uh, also less homework. No one likes homework, right? And then I tend to uh, follow up after the class. So follow up with uh, more detailed tutorials or videos, um, extra learning too. Some students are going to forge ahead and you want to support that. So you want to give them the next step um, or more detailed or, or allow them to go deeper into that content if they really want to. You know, you, you always have a classroom, you're going to have a range of students, so you want to make sure every no one's getting bored. Um, and lastly, when they submit their assignment, I usually give them a week to submit their assignment, you give direct feedback. Um, I don't like giving uh, just grades or like looks good or something. I talk specifically to that person and their feedback and give them direct feedback about what they're doing and what uh, should have been changed, right? So um, it's a really good re approach, and it really embraces that repeating something three times. Um, so who can tell me what the Socratic method is? Now, of course, this is an online video, so that becomes a rhetorical question. Um, <clears throat> so don't answer it. To engage a classroom, it's less about lecturing, and it's more about discussing and questioning. The Socratic method is at its core the practice of asking questions and debating the answers together to get to the truth. Um, the benefit of that is that the class is an active participant in the search towards the truth. And by engaging the class in debate, even on the smallest thing, even on obvious things, things that, that are plain to everybody to see, we immediately jump up that cone of learning that we saw before and we retain more because everybody's engaged. The simple act of debating something, even if you know the right answer, cements things more deeply. And here's where this gets really cool. The class itself can be the best teacher. The more they learn from each other, rather than from you as a teacher, the more success they'll have as students. So for me, if my students can teach the class, I've done my job well as a teacher. So instead of giving the answer, try asking the other students and see if someone knows the answer. You'll find that information cements much de deeper. And the reason for this is humans are social creatures. We are wired towards positive interactions. Um, you've surely seen this, uh, friends in social circles, uh, they tend to follow each other in behavior. And this is no different than in a classroom. So the behavior you want them to follow is speaking up and providing knowledge. And so when a student posits the right answer and you reward them with positive feedback, this is so much more effective than just telling them that right answer. The class will pick it up. And, and this gets tricky. You really have to make it clear to students that they have to participate uh, and have to join the discussion. And this is the biggest challenge. Some people just want to be quiet. Some people don't even want to pay attention. But the problem is you know that when they get to the studio, they have to communicate. They have to work as a team. So you need to start building those skills earlier. And the science is pointing to the value of frequent uh, quizzing, for example, as a way to improve retrieval strength or your ability to remember the right knowledge at the right time. So frequently accessing that knowledge cements it further. And a very simple and great way to do this is to ask the class questions often. This is basically quizzing, but you don't have to hand them a piece of paper and make them fill out the quiz. Just keep the discussion going and keep asking questions. 
Ultimately, teaching is about getting a student from a problem that you give them to a solution that you want them to, to be able to execute. Uh, but the problem is a lot of teachers often just hand them the solution. And this is something everybody's excited. You're proud of your knowledge. Um, you're proud of what you've gotten to. And you're, you you want to give people the solution. But it's actually not the right thing for them. I always find I catch myself um, and go, ah, i got to keep my mouth shut on this one. The real goal is to take them on the journey that you took to get from that problem to that solution. Because that's how they'll learn it. The Socratic method is, is rhetorical. Uh, it's more about discussion. So you actually have to test things and do them to, to see if they actually are, are successful. But when they actively contribute to that learning and they're taken on that journey from problem to solution, they will get it. So it's really, instead of giving them the answer, go, hmm, why don't you try this? See what happens. Let's talk about it afterwards. Communication is really important too. You know, ed education often focuses on what and how. You need to press this button, here's how you press it. But we know this is not really the student we want in our studios. It's really important to get them asking and ask yourself, why? Uh, this is my biggest frustration often with, with graduates I'm hiring today. If they know, they don't ask why and they can't explain why. If they know why, they will know how to apply learning. Uh, and when it's appropriate. It's not just about pressing that button. When do you use that button? Why do you use that button? What does it do? Is there an alternative? So always ask them the simple question. Why should we do this? And why are you doing that? Don't just tell them the answer or what something is or how to do it. And really that's about building hard and soft skills. So hard skills are measurable definable skills how to do something they're easy to grade like for example uh, how to do something uh, how to use some software technical capabilities accreditations uh, rote knowledge this is the year that so and so happened the ability to speak a language so these are all easily to measure uh, definable skills right but on the other hand, we have soft skills, and these are intangible qualities. They are hard to grade, but that shouldn't stop us. Things like communication skills, the ability to work well in a team, innovation, creativity, problem solving, flexibility, resilience, time management, leadership, curiosity, right? These are all soft skills. Luckily, we don't have to choose between them, but I know if you were hiring I expect that if you had to pick between one of these columns in terms of an employee, it would probably be the right soft skills column that you pick because the, the hard skills are often easier to train someone in. So how do we teach a student soft skills? I want to give a great example. So Irina Schink Pivkina uh, was a student at Centennial College and you can see some of her work here. She made soft skills a priority in her learning. Um, she always sought feedback. I've never seen a student so interested in how she could make something better. She didn't just want to be told it was good. She wanted to know, how do I improve this? How do I make this professional? And that led her on a path to constant inquiry, learning more. It improved her skills well beyond what our class could offer. And now she's an active member of the VFX community in Toronto and doing some amazing work. So. How do we build these soft skills? I'll move myself over here. What I found really works well is creating a culture of peer and self-analysis. So in the studios, we often have weeklies and dailies, where as a group, we get together and critique work and share feedback and give ideas. Um, do the same thing with your students. So teach them how to talk about what they see. This is important. How do you explain it? Does that look good? Why does it look good? What about it looks good? And so to do that, they need a language to, to work from. So you, you need to define a language of analysis to do this. As I mentioned, one of the problems that can happen here is jargon. Um, so having a glossary of terms really helps. Make sure everybody's using the same word to say the same thing. Um, you'd be surprised, especially when you're dealing with people coming from multiple cultures. This is really critically important. And then analyze their work as a group on a daily basis and encourage constructive feedback. Don't just say that looks good. Why does it look good? And what can you do to make it better? Don't just say it looks bad. Why Why does it look bad? What's wrong here that it's making this look bad? And what can we do to improve it? Um, so anytime I give an assignment, 
before handing in the assignment, the students do group critique and they give feedback to each other. And this really takes advantage of the, the social aspect of hearing feedback and knowledge from another student as opposed to the teacher uh, that I find really useful. So again, if as a teacher, you, you'll be really successful if the students in your class can critique the other students better than you can. Now I'm going to give you an example of some slides I show to the students to help this along. So these are slides I show to the students on the first class of a, a second semester rendering class in visual effects. So how to analyze renderings. Hold your own dailies, be honest, be honest, ask for feedback, have something to show. This is another really important thing. You can't get feedback on a frequent basis if you don't have something to show. So to me, there's nothing worse than the students who go for weeks and then come in with some work. I don't even know if they did the work, right? So it's really important to encourage in the classroom that people show work that is rough. Uh, that still needs work and not be afraid to get feedback on it so that they can get early feedback and iterate on it in a more effective way. Right. So I showed this slide to the students uh, and then I get them talking, building their glossary. So I go into detail on what is light quality, what is surface quality, optical quality, and what is an artistic quality, composition, and things like this. So we get into these, how we define the terms and what they mean and what they look like. And then we look at a bunch of different renderings. And as a group, we critique those renderings. What did they do well? What are the light quality, surface, optical, and artistic qualities of this work? And how can we use those, term, the, the, those details to improve the work? Then we also look at success criteria. So defining those success criteria, does it meet technical requirements? Does it meet the vision? Uh, a lot of times students have the benefit of just doing something without having some pre-production or concept work created to set a goal. And they might get to some uh, answer that looks good, but it doesn't necessarily test the fact that they had a plan in the first place. And so always comparing the final product to the concept and the pre-production work uh, is a critical way to reinforce that behavior that you expect out of your, your students coming in, into your studio. Is it photorealistic? Is it, you know, if intended, transparent? Does it help perpetuate the story? What is the story we're trying to tell? Is it consistent with the other work? Is it on budget? These are all things that are really important, especially when working in a studio. So getting students thinking about them and talking about them ahead of time is really important. And so after we go through some images, I, I ask the students to find their own, either take their own rendering or go find another rendering. And then as a group, we critique it using what we learned to, to further reinforce that. So really, uh, I love this class. It's one of my favorite classes and the students really um, like it. And I always put it at the beginning of the semester because it helps break the ice and it helps um, uh, create this culture of self and peer analysis that I really want so badly. Okay. Another thing that's important as a teacher is teaching how to self-teach. And my favorite thing to say whenever someone asks me a question is how would you find an answer to this question? It's a great opportunity to teach someone how to teach themselves because you're not going to be there when they graduate and they still need to learn and they still need to evolve. And my favorite thing is when I don't know something, when, when a student comes up to me and says, how do you do that? And I don't know, I very honestly will usually say, hey, I don't know, let's find out together. Let's explore, go on Google, type in some search terms, see if we can find the answer to this together. Um, and I found that to be a, a great way to reinforce self-teaching. Another thing that really works and, and is one of my favorite teaching techniques is breaking things. Because you learn when you when something's broken and you learn when you're stressed and you learn when you have to fix things. Um, so learning through failure can be a very powerful tool for a teacher. Recovering from screw ups. And I just learned this organically. I found that when I made a mistake or my files broke or something went wrong and I had to fix it in front of the students, I found they learned more than if I just showed them the right way. So after a while, I started intentionally putting failures into my demonstrations to show how to solve that problem and how to think about solving the problems. And so it, here's, some, here's some ways you can do that. One, break file pathing. This is a really easy thing that students get wrong. Obviously, you're working in a bigger studio. File pathing is generally handled by the pipeline, but it's a great way to get them thinking about it. Hey, where are my textures? Well, let's figure it out. 
providing scenes with incorrect starting parameters. So give them a scene to start, but make sure that they have the wrong starting parameters and get them to fix, let's say, render settings, for example. Using suboptimal footage, you know, make them, like, maybe the green screen isn't so green. How do we fix that? And on and on. I think you can use your imagine, imagination here. And, and this is where it's so important to be present and have them working in class, because it's really hard to do this kind of thing when it's just a lecture or they're watching a video or they're doing their learning away from the classroom. You really want to be in a state where when they encounter that problem, you can go through the pro process of fixing it. And that's, I found, really where the learning happens. Communication is important too. You have to be very careful about asking open-ended qu questions. This can be a, a challenge. So I n tr always try to never ask yes or no questions. Um, for example, do you understand how to do this? Most of the time a student is invariably going to say yes, even if they don't really know, they figure they're going to figure it out. So a better way to ask that question is, please explain to me how you would do this why you would do this, in what scenario you would do this. When you ask questions like that, someone really has to understand the content to be able to answer it, and you can get a better idea of how successful your teaching is in terms of getting them to understand those things. Tell me what you did worked, what didn't work, what would you do differently next time? These are all great questions to really understand uh, how much your students really internalize learning. The other thing that I find is absolutely critical is the importance of iteration. So you have to teach how to iterate. Uh, when you're drawing a picture, you don't just start at the top and draw every line perfectly. You sketch, you rough it in, and get more detail, more detail. This is harder to do than for me to say it. Students will often focus on what they know. Um, so they're going to hone in the details to say they know to model. They're going to spend their time modeling because that's what they know. They won't uh, go into the scarier or riskier things, which is where the learning really happens. So encourage them to iterate and do something rough and then get feedback. To sketch in their work, figuratively and literally, uh, and, t and test their work all the way along the uh, as they're iterating on it to get to a real final program. They need, this way they'll find what's going to break earlier on, they'll learn faster, and they'll be able to de-risk um, the problem areas and not spend so much time at the end having to redo things. The critical thing to make sure this happens is having something to show. So making sure the students have something to show for every class um, will allow this iteration to happen and will allow them to get feedback much quicker. And by the way, this art is from James Ray's box office artist. Uh, he's a, a teacher I've had the pleasure of working with, and he has a really cool uh, YouTube channel. You should check it out if you like comic art. Um, yeah. Now, uh, you want them to take feedback constructively, and to do that, you have to set an example. So you have to prove it by taking feedback yourself. I found this to be critical. Um, one of the things that Centennial encourages for teachers that I really love is this idea of a stop, start, and continue. So after a few weeks in the course, or let's say halfway through the course, depending on how you structure it, you ask the students very simple questions. As a teacher, what should I stop doing? What should I start doing? And what should I continue doing? I.e., what am I doing well? Um, these three questions are very easy to answer. It's easy to get an honest answer from them. And it shows the students that, especially if you act on the feedback, that giving feedback and taking constructive feedback and iterating on things is going to be effectively successful because you're going to do something that helps them, right? So this is really important. Another thing that can often go wrong is that, especially as an industry professional, you, you might tend to speak in solutions. And students will often ask questions in what they think is a solution. So they might say something like, how do I make a UV set? Already jumping to the conclusion that what they need to do is make a UV set. This is the same thing when I worked on the Maya team for many years, it was the same thing. Many people would say, oh, how do I how do I do X? And then I'd always try and get them to take a step back and go, what, what are you actually trying to do? Oh, trying to do that. Okay, there's a much easier way to do it. So it's really important that you don't talk in uh, solutions and you teach your students not to talk in solutions, but to talk in 
problems. So a better alternative to this question is how do I create alternate UVs for different materials? Because you might look at that and go, oh, well, you could use UV sets, but actually you should be looking at, at uh, UDIMs or UV tiles because that is a better, more modern, uh, more studio-appropriate way to do it. Um, and it, it, so if they ask the question the right way, you can answer it in a much more effective way. So I encourage both you and your students avoid talking in solutions and always talk in problems. What is the problem I'm trying to solve? Right. Schedule everything. So set a schedule, measure it, um, and know that you're going to get it wrong. So anytime a student is working on a project, we always start by scheduling it out. We break out the task. What do you think you're going to do to get this done? Oh, did you? and how long is it going to take you? And did you know you forgot about this particular step? Oh, interesting, you didn't. Students are going to get this wrong, and that's fine, but the, in the process of getting it wrong, we'll learn from it. Even industry professionals are terrible at estimating things. We're always wrong, but it's the process of doing it, the, it that's so important to helping students succeed. The likelihood is that most of these tasks will happen far more in parallel, and that's to be encouraged in many ways, uh, but it's important for the students to learn them the, the, learn this themselves. It's not something you can just explain to something. They have to understand it. Um, the, and, and what I find is great is halfway through the project, we can go to the schedule and say, hey, are we halfway through the schedule? No? Okay, maybe we need to lower the scope of this project to achieve your deadline, right? So it's a really powerful tool setting schedule. I highly encourage doing this. Okay. So we looked at some techniques in the class. Uh, I want to also look at um, how the studio plays a role in the classroom and how we can be better teachers by bringing what we know in the studio into the classroom. So almost every class I'm teaching, I have something like this graph up and I'm talking about it. So even if we're teaching a particular kind of student, it's really important that that student know uh, who's receiving their work and what work and who's producing the work they're receiving so they understand how the pipeline flows. So every technique and concept I teach, I always try and reinforce where that technique sits in the pipeline and what predicates and what comes after, what comes before so that um, students can come out knowing how the pipeline flows um, and where their chosen area of focus fits in and what they need to do to be a good citizen in a studio. So this applies even if you're training specialists, it's really important. Another thing that I like to do, and we don't always have the opportunity to do it, um, but uh, one thing I heard as, as a teacher talking to studi uh, studios that hire my students, um, many of them complained that they had to train them in shotgun or, or task management systems and review uh, systems in general. And so we're trying to put this in the classroom, and many other schools have effectively uh, put shotgun in the classroom. Uh, and this is a great way to give feedback to students because it trains them already to get feedback uh, to keep an eye on shotgun and um, to use the system so that when they come in the studio it's not so foreign and they can hit the ground running. What's also really cool is that shotgun from Autodesk is free for educators so you should be able to put this into your school with just a little bit of effort uh, and no no cost so definitely a, a great thing to help your class. The class isn't a studio, we know this, but it should be, really. Real-world assignments are fantastic. Uh, there's a school called Escape uh, Studios, and they're awesome because they don't have teachers, they have HODs, heads of department, and students are working on a real project in a real pipeline. Um, and this is a great way to teach and prep people for, for the real world in the studio. It's not always appropriate, but the more you can do it, the better. And I'll give you a really simple example and something that's almost evil, but <laughs> really works well. At some point in the course, try stopping the students doing the assignment halfway and then having them trade their assignments with another student to finish. Um, it's a really simple approach, but it really teaches the importance of keeping your files clean and organized and legible to someone else picking it up or you picking it up six months down the road. Uh, it's tough and shocking, but it's real. Another great example is group work. 
group work can be perilous. Uh, at the same time, I I remember my first job. I the studio that hired me didn't even look at my reel. They just asked, did, "Did you work on that group project that I saw come out of your school?" I said yes, and they're like, "Great, we want people who can work in groups. Come on board." Um, and that was it. Now that might be a bit extreme, but you know, group group work has been scientifically shown to be more effective at teaching as social interaction activates more of the brain. And we've talked about this in a few different scenarios. But you have to be wary. Uh, if a group is focused and well planned, they will succeed. If not, they will fail, and that failure will be even worse because now now they're affecting each other's education and they're uh, each other's schooling, and that's not that creates a extra social tension that you don't want and can have some pretty bad outcomes. Um, so generally with group works, I, I tend to encourage them very early on and I'll say things like, okay, you have a cool idea for a group project? Start planning it now for the next semester because if those students can work together uh, early on and then in the next semester come to the table with a plan to work on a group project, you have a good sense that they're going to succeed as a group. So that's a good tip. Um, one thing I, I also like to do is assign group assignments. So here's an example. Um, I'll talk a bit about where I, where this comes from. Um, but it's a really simple lighting assignment. You have three shots in a sequence. We have three lighters in a group. And those three lighters have to produce a consistent result um, working together. Uh, at the same time, I give them a file naming convention and a folder structure that mimics common pipeline and ask them to work into it. And I grade them on whether their, the work they do is consistent so that their lighting looks cohesive and that I can look through their file structure and their naming convention and know exactly where everything is, know who did what, and um, be able to insert myself into it as, as I would in the studio. Um, so I find it a really effective assignment. Um, now this content, uh, when I was at Autodesk, I helped work on this project. It's called Hyperspace Madness. It was an internal project meant to vet uh, software like Maya, pieces of software. Uh, but at the same time, if you go to the URL there, you can download the content free, open source, under Creative Commons to you Creative Commons to use in your teaching. And some of these assets are pretty production quality, so pretty pretty handy. Uh, another one that another teacher at Centennial College, George Rosson, turned me on to, which is really awesome, this uh, Blender project called Tears of Steel. So this is a group that was worked on a short film, and they open sourced all their footage, and it's beautiful 4K EXR footage. So if you're teaching compositing, this is really awesome stuff. So check it out. Okay, creating effective assignments. We need to test those learning outcomes. Um, so how do we do it really well? Creativity, I found, and like I went to art school ages ago and, and learned this then, Con constraint is a great way to encourage creativity. Nothing is more scary for, for many artists than a blank page and no guidance and no box to work in. Um, this can be incredibly daunting because not only are you are trying to learn the techniques, uh, the software, how to use computers, how to interact as a class, at the same time you also have to come up with some creative stuff and, and be a great artist. It's challenging. So I like to give them constraint. Give them a cool box to work in. So here's a great example. That character Sven uh, you saw running before, he has a weapon. It's a very simple asset. It's very easy to texture. And I asked them to get some reference, some, some photographic, photographic reference of a weapon, weapon and, and apply what they see in that reference and try and match it as if it was a concept uh, using that weapon. weapon. And you, you can, can see you get some, some really nice results. results. This, this is, is also an opportunity to teach them the basics of look development and shading, how to present your look development in a turntable, render it out properly, things like that. The results you can see come out pretty cool. It gives the students an opportunity to express themselves creatively and focus on a theme that they're interested in. And it, it really helps them dig into the details without having too complex an asset to work on. And you can see the results are pretty cool. Another great example uh, in a compositing course that I give I teach an assignment very early on, Basics of Compositing, where I take these four images on the left and we work together to merge them into the one image on the right through teaching basic compositing techniques like uh, roto, color correction, as edge control, um, and effects. And uh, um, so this becomes kind of a, a boot camp uh, in compositing and the students get through it quickly and then I ask them to do it themselves in the next class. And so here's an example of a student move my head, there we are. 
uh, images you see on the left and put them together using the techniques they learn on the right. Um, and this is a, a student actually who works for me. He's, he's a really talented guy. So you can see for uh, someone who is completely new to compositing, the results can be quite cool. In production, in production, there will almost always be reference material provided. Um, so I always require students to provide reference material for the work, or I give them to give it to them as part of the assignment. Uh, and our outcomes often refer to directly working from reference material. This may be reference material from clients or supervisors, whatever it is. We don't work blind in, in the industry, so our students shouldn't work blind as well. Uh, and we tend to mark them based on uh, looking at those outcomes and comparing their work to the reference and to the planning that they did. Um, so this assignment you're looking at here turned out particularly good at inspiring students to work from reference and showing us what kind of creativity there is out there. Um, this is concept art that was produced by our uh, one of our coordinators, Dalbor Janovich, and the model below was built by uh, one of our, our teachers and coordinators, Bo Ruziki. Um, they kindly provided both elements for uh, my lighting class, and for the assignment, I asked the students to recreate the lighting from the concept using the 3D model. And they have the option, they can either match the reference, or they can find their own reference and kind of match that look, um, or apply the concept art look to another space. So we give them some flexibility within those constraints to express their creativity, but still always show that ability to look at a concept uh, piece and apply that to a, a work of lighting and rendering. So this turned out pretty good. Here's a cool example some students just matching the concept art and you can see uh, relatively quickly they can get some nice results. Um, still a little bit of work to do here but good start. So here's work done by a student named Mark uh, where he he's actually someone who ended up being a cinematographer. He took uh, a still from a movie he loved and applied it to this concept to try and match the lighting and atmosphere and I think he did a fantastic job. And here's another example from a student named Krista, uh, who applied the look from a piece of art. Um, so you can see there's a lot of room in here to express creativity. And then we take the concept of assignment and open it up. Um, so here's a, another student who got some concept art used for Stranger Things and tried to match that look of like shiny night, wet, uh, fog, and police lights. And uh, I think she did a fantastic job. And she's working now in the industry and doing an amazing, amazing work. So really cool assignment. Now, uh, rubrics. So <clears throat> a rubric is basically a set of criteria for grading assignments. A rubric allows you to establish first delivery requirements. So it's really important to be specific. I want a QuickTime file, this resolution, this frames per second. Um, give them clear delivery requirements and get them into a state where they're asking for that because a lot of times in production we need to know that information to deliver our work. Um, set goals and expectations. Why are we doing this assignment? What outcome are we looking to prove? And why are we here? Because that's really critical. Um, and what do I expect? So I expect you to do this and this and this to execute this assignment. Set criteria for evaluation. So how am I going to be grading this? Uh, is it going to be based on matching the reference? Is it going to be the, based on the quality of the image? Based on the um, analysis criteria that we talked about at the beginning of the course? Um, and what is the standard for excellent? excellence? What does an A look like? And this is really good if you can show previous work from students. If you're able to do that, it uh, really helps students understand what they're supposed to do. And especially when you're dealing with an assignment where you have that creative flexibility, um, you don't get people copying, you, it just inspires them. Um, and it worked. Really important to establish that rubric ahead of time whenever you give an assignment. So coming back to the mastery cycle. Um, we talked about this before. These are the steps that a student or anybody needs to take to be a master of something. Um, this can be a real challenge. I mean, it takes up to seven years to become a master of something, like we said. But there's a way you can break this down. And it's important to break this down because it's hard when you're a student. You have to learn so much. You have to learn how the software works. You have to learn um, how computers work. You have to learn the techniques and the concepts. It's a lot to take in all at once. So if you can break this down and get them 
to success quicker, you will build confidence. And the way to do that is to take this path in whatever you're trying to teach and break it down into a set of smaller steps and try and take the th students through those smaller steps to master each little step along the way that combines towards the entire technique and the concept. And this helps to not overload them and helps to boost their confidence every step of the way. And the, the other important factor here is softwares can be very complex. Um, and this is where I, I, I look to, to software vendors to help uh, fit that gap. Uh, to me, teachers should really be focusing on the concepts and the techniques um, and not this is that where that button is hiding in the software or this is how to deal with this bug in the software. Um, I think that's really on software vendors to help teachers educate, provide them with materials. Uh, and some are better, some are definitely better than others. Um, but I definitely love to see more uh, responsibility taken on the software vendor part for the education of students students using that software. And it's definitely going in a great trend uh, that I'm happy to see. Recording lectures. So these are a great tool for students to rely on, uh, but I found there are some challenges. If you're going to record your lectures, it's important to set constraints for the students because a lot of students, when they know that the classroom is going to be recorded, they might tune out. They might focus on something else that they think is more important to them at the time, excuse me, knowing that they can rec watch the recording of the lecture later. Um, that recording should really just be to reinforce something that they learned properly in the classroom. And one way to do this is really to make a deal up front and just say, okay, I will record this class, but if I see anybody tuning out or walking out or not paying attention because of the recording, I'm not going to record anymore. And by establishing that agreement up front, it definitely can help uh, make sure that everybody's paying attention and relying on the recordings in an effective way. Um, another thing I like to do is just I'll take little screen captures. It's really easy to hit the print screen button as you're teaching. Um, paste those images as a layer into Photoshop or whatever image editing program you have. And then after you can just make a nicely annotated uh, long JPEG or something that walks through a technique. It can be very effective because it's very quick. They don't have to watch the video to go through it. They can just pop to the section that they're looking for and get what they need. So annotated screen captures can be a, a very effective replacement to, uh, to to recording a lecture. And here's an example of one of these annotated images. And I'll just very quickly, this is a bit older, um, but you can see I just take screen captures, give little annotations, what are the steps, what, what things need to be pressed as they go, where can things go wrong. This is very important, by the way, if you're if you're teaching something always, always, always talk about where things go wrong and show them how to fix it. I can't understate that enough. And so these kind of like just um, tutorials in a JPEG, I find can be really effective as well. You get the idea. Okay, so it's not just about uh, teaching them well. You have to effectively get a student from the classroom to the workplace, and that can pose a lot of a lot of challenges. So, a lot of the industry likes to look at things in generalist versus specialist, and I'm sure there were many who are going to disagree with me on this one. Um, but I found that it's very hard for students to specialize until they've had a few years of doing these things. You can't know you're going to be into effects unless you've tried it, for example. And it's important to give those students those opportunities. Uh, at the same time, what was a specialist five years ago is not going to be a specialist in the next five years. Requirements change, uh, techniques and tools get democratized, things change. And so even though we need to hire specific roles, I find it's much better to start students as generalists and work them towards specialists. It ensures they have a solid understanding of the industry, that they can pick the specialization that most interests them and that they're, they're going to be the most successful in. Um, and then they can continue their education. There are finishing schools that will take students coming out of college and really focus on teaching them things like FX or lighting or animation. You know, And even if they do really focus on a particular specialty, it's really critical that they understand where their specialty fits in the pipeline. To me, that, that's the most important thing. Um, so that they can participate in the studio as a community member and not just filling the role and throwing stuff over the fence and picking stuff up that was thrown over the fence to them, right? 
another another factor here is how you see the students so we all know about rock stars right um, the students and the the hires that clearly show incredible talent and standout skills it's really important to have these rock stars on your team to push the team forward and inspire people and do great work that said rock stars are often rock stars because they are great self-promoters as well as being skilled and talented artists not everyone is a great self-promoter but that doesn't mean they're they're not great artists so you have to find that that diamond in the rough um, and find the person with the right skills they may not be self-promoting so well at first ultimately it's on us to, to help them and so by bringing everybody along for the ride by making sure everybody understands uh, the teachings every step of the way and challenging and not setting your opinions until you really see what they can do you will find the real hidden talent in the classroom and this has paid off I found many of the, the most talented people I've hired have been the ones you didn't expect to do that well and you have to be really careful because if you have expectations for someone um, if you if you're in your head think oh they're not going to do so well you're going to change your behavior whether you're no matter how hard you're trying and you have to as a teacher keep things open and careful and give everybody equal opportunity um, to ensure that ultimately you find that diamond in the rough um, part of doing that is making sure students produce proof of work so here's an example I talked about the student uh, Irina before Irina Pivkina um, this is a, a final project she did in uh, second semester um, visual effects where she did a CG plant and a, uh, a map painting a composite and this is great to see and you know when we when we do a demo reel of course you see a breakdown but what I encourage the students to do is also document their process and I'll show you what I mean here so here is Irina's blog production blog and so on this blog she noted here's her concept here's her storyboards um, here's some concept work for the flower and a drone here's some texture examples and so this is all part of getting the students to think about pre-production and collecting the reference material and making a proposal that's going to be effective reference footage test footage um, you get the picture and the beauty of this is um, once they complete this and they keep updating it this can be part of their hiring package and so as um, as an employer when I see something like this I know the student uh, was capable of working on it I know the the thought process they took to get there for me this really helped helps me understand who I'm gonna hire and it makes gives me the confidence to hire someone uh, more junior uh, with less work experience because I can really see what they're capable of doing and how they go about it especially when it comes oops over here especially when it comes to the scheduling and how that worked out right so uh, I find that that having the students document their process for a project um, usually in the in the later semesters when they're working on more individual projects really helps um, them get their thought process sorted out uh, it gives you something to interact on uh, and give feedback to directly and it becomes great um, demo reel material and part of the hiring package when when they graduate and they're looking for work there's a website uh, called the rookies uh, that is uh, really great one sec let me okay so uh, the the rookies .co, this is a great online community um, for digital artists and students to share their work um, and it really helps push people to do better because you really see what the people out there are, are contributing um, and it's a great platform for teachers to interact with students um, and uh, to to make sure that students are hitting key industry goals along their their learning path uh, a, a really great tool I encourage everybody to take a look at this so I want to talk about another student I had Yuna Jung so um, when Yuna uh, started she was frustrated with simple tasks and then at some point something clicked uh, let's take a look at her work here something clicked and after about after the two-year program was done she was proving herself to be one of the best students I've ever had um, she had a thirst for knowledge and a lack of intimidation and techniques um, and this was something she didn't present as a rock star in the beginning uh, 
Uh, I could have easily missed her, and now I'm very disappointed I wasn't able to hire on my, her, my team because she's doing incredibly work in the industry. And I even found out later she had no computer at home. She was doing this all at the school, and so it really cemented for me the idea that um, real talent can be hidden because, for example, if you don't have a computer at home, it's hard to produce extra work. You're really reliant on, on the school. And so if you can play even a tiny part in helping someone in this way to discover their talent without without being biased in your own way, um, you're doing you're doing something right. So highly encouraged. All right. So the other thing that's important is life skills. <laughs> Many of us know this food product when we were in college. It's not nutritious. Uh, when I when I gave this presentation in Serbia, I I had asked, um, "What does a Serbian college student eat?" And this is the image I got. Looks delicious. Um, but uh, we're also on the hook to teach life skills. So it's really important that you teach students how to find a job, how to take an interview what to expect and how to negotiate salaries, how to shake hands and handle tough questions in interviews, how to budget, right? You you want people to be healthy and happy and have the skills to get employed. It's not, you know, and that's really about what your, uh, what your learning outcome is. Is the learning outcome you want to produce someone who knows how to press the button of the software or do you want to produce someone who's going to be successful in, in, in the industry? And if your outcome is industry success, one of those success factors is life skills. And part of that is is on the internship front. So at Centennial College, four semester students are required to do an eight week internship. Uh, this will often result in a hire if the student is doing well. Um, and our teachers in the college who are all working industry professionals will usually pick the interns that they've seen succeed in the class. And there's a nice pipeline to go directly into the, the workforce. Um, but it's important to understand that an, uh, someone doing their internship is a human being at their most fragile state. Um, they are starting a career and having to prove themselves. Um, they have, they probably have student debt that they need to pay off, and they, they look at that as a huge investment they made in this future that is hinging on what happens right now. Um, they've left the comfort of the school. Uh, so it's really important that when you bring on an intern, and I encourage every studio to do so, um, give them something real to do. You're spending the money to give them a computer, give them a spot, you're spending the time. Make sure it's valuable for you as an employer to have that intern, so give them something real to do. Don't just have them getting coffee. And you'll be surprised. Usually, that student will actually produce quality work, and it'll be easier to hire. You'll get something work for you know not a lot of money not a big investment you'll get some work out of that student um, and you'll be helping to give someone a career and give them a start in the industry and mentor them in a way that they, they wouldn't normally have so I'm a huge fan of inter internships a lot of studios um, come to Centennial College just because of this policy of, of uh, in, uh, requiring the students to do an internship um, and it's tough. Like it can be tough for them to find opportunities. Um, so it's really on us to help them find those opportunities. Um, uh, but ultimately, the better thing is to give them the skills and the research and the the abilities to help them find that internship on their own. Maybe a little helping hand. Um, Another great example of this uh, as an intern is Alini Anoi. So a student I had in, I think this was my first year teaching 12 years ago, uh, and she's worked on some great projects at studios like Pixamondo in Toronto. And for her, that uh, internship was the key to getting that job and success in that career. And, you know, a decade later, she's doing amazing. So. Um, you know, I, I fully encourage the internships. Another great example is an employee I hired through an internship directly from, from a class I was taking, Shavina Valentina. This is someone who was a generalist and um, Every every day she she surprises me with thinking about problems and coming up with unique unique ways to approach them and also saving us money. She'll she'll think beyond the problem and she'll help catch issues down the road. And that's not something I would have expected from a student, um, but by giving her the internship, it allowed me to see that opportunity in that person and gave me the confidence to hire. And it's worked out in spades. 
And so what's really important here in the process of hiring a lot of my students and talking to other supervisors, uh, it's become clear that you as a supervisor can be a bottleneck to someone's success. And it often has to do with how you see that person. So I try now uh, to not think in junior uh, versus senior. Um, I try to think in skills and opportunity. What skills does that person bring to the table? Um, and what is the opportunity they can apply those skills in? So try to forget junior versus senior and look at everybody equally and see what they can do. Um, and I'll give you a great example of that. Andre Co. Another student of mine who I've hired and who's still working with me today at, at uh, Folks VFX, it, to me it was a great internship success story. He was a student from Brazil. I didn't know his background. I didn't, I didn't spend the time to really get to know him in class. Uh, and that was actually a mistake because when I hired him at Folks, um, the first job I put him on was modeling a, a, a CG stadium model. Within a few days, he came back with something phenomenal. It was like realistic and accurate. And then I discovered that he actually was an architect in Brazil before he came to Canada and started in uh, computer graphics industry. Um, and so he brought those skills to the table. And uh, you know, it was my mistake to not really understand what his background was. But that internship allowed me to get a picture of who that person was and what they could bring to the table and, and take better advantage of it and give them uh, more opportunity. I can't stress this enough, um, the internships will benefit you as a company with very little investment. What's next? Um, so if you've watched this and you're excited about getting into the industry and getting into teaching, if you're an industry pro, I encourage you to find a local school. Maybe your studio is already uh, hiring from, from a current school. Get in touch with them. Um, a good place to start is by getting on their program advisory council. It's a good way to get introduced and give your feedback and voice in the development of the courses and the way they, they progress. And then talk to them about teaching. Um, be active in the school community and get to know the coordinators of, the, of your local schools and that's a great way to get a uh, foot in the door uh, as a teacher. Now if you run a studio I highly encourage you to talk to your local college or university, get on their advisory council, think about uh, developing a, a routine internship program, uh, have a voice in that school development and uh, be a more active member of that community. Another cool thing to check out is Access VFX. So this is a global effort to enable online membership in the VFX animation community. Uh, this uh, website was started by Simon Devereaux, who's the head of learning and development at The Mill, who I had the pleasure of meeting at CGA Belgrade, and I really fell in love with this program. Um, if you're a student, check it out, get on here, see if you can get a mentor. If you're someone in the industry, um, get on here and help mentor a student. So it's not, you don't have to be a teacher to really contribute. There's smaller ways we can do it, and I think Access VFX is a great example of that. Okay, so that was um, a very long lecture. You've probably retained only 20% of it, and I can't apply a lot of the things I've explained to ensure that you've retained it. Um, but hopefully there's some good stuff in there for you. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Lawrence Smet. I hope this has been useful to you and you've enjoyed it. Um, if, I would love it if you sent me an email with your thoughts, questions. Um, even happier if there's some way I can improve these learnings or if there's something you don't agree with, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to talk about it uh, and improve on these ideas and concepts. So I wish you the best in uh, hopefully what is a, a new teaching career or some new course development. Um, and again, I hope this was useful and I hope you have a good day. Take care.